to those of you who are joining us for the first time. This is being recorded, and I need to acknowledge that. Uh, I would uh, very much and very warmly like to introduce my colleague, my co-host, my co-conspirator, uh, Nikki Clemens. Uh, Nikki, as many of you probably know, uh, is uh, going to offer us an intermezzo uh, today, right at the halfway point between uh, the speakers we've had in the past and the speakers we will have in the future. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, what is to follow, except for my own closing remarks, which will be lame and uh, undoubtedly ending the conference, uh, as E.E. E. Cummings put it about the world, uh, not with a bang, but with a whimper, uh, in part because the richness of uh, what we've heard so far and what we're undoubtedly going to hear today and in the future is extraordinarily difficult to summarize. Um, my colleague, uh, Nikki, cross-departmental colleague, uh, is uh, the occupant of two uh, endowed chairs at Rice, the Watt uh, and Lily Jackson Chair in Religion, and the Allison Serafim Chair in Distinguished Teaching in the Humanities. Uh, she is a true model of interdisciplinary scholarship, and uh, her work transverses philosophy, the anthropology, my own discipline, history, and the intersection of all of those uh, in uh, an inquiry not simply into Foucault's oeuvre, but also into much, much broader issues that his works raise, including uh, his work uh, late into the history of ethics. Um, and I would like to say that exemplary of her brilliance and her tirelessness and the breadth and the depth of her scholarship is her Sites of the ascetic self, John Cashin and the early Christian and early Christian ethical formation, which was published in 2020 by Notre Dame Press, uh, which uh, anyone who thinks of himself as or herself or themselves as a scholar of anything whatsoever should read at least twice. Uh, the second reading will reveal subtleties. Uh, that her very, very lucid uh, skills in composition uh, already yield in, in the first go around. Uh, uh, just to say a bit more about the monograph, um, it firmly establishes Professor Clements as a horizontal figure in the critical engagement with Foucault's oeuvre. Um, and I see her being horizontal from this point into an indefinite and, and long future. And I'm sure we'll all also look forward to uh, the scholarly and the intellectual contribution that she will be offering us with the publication of her current work in pro progress, which is called Foucault the Confessor. Nikki is going to speak to us today on uh, what I presume is a <clears throat> an abridged version of an article that she published in 2021 uh, in the American Academy of uh, Religion Journal on Foucault's Christianity. And Nikki, I am not going to interfere uh, with your presentation any longer, but simply turn the floor over to you and thank you, please, all of us. Uh, welcome, Nikki to our speaker's podium, uh, as it were, today. Thank you so much, Jim. I could not do this without you. I'm so grateful to you for being my companion within this, and also for being one of the um, 
the, the path breakers when it comes to thinking about Foucault from multiple disciplines and especially oriented towards this question of ethics that we both find so urgent. I want to take a minute and recognize the Humanities Research Center, notably Melissa Baylor and Fares Aldada, who have been supporting this work very explicitly in my own scholarship, but also made the conditions for our gathering in this series. My Department of Religion is also exceptionally supportive, and I thank all of you, in particular my uh, chair, Elias Bangba, and Diana Hurd and Marcy Newton, who have been providing invaluable support throughout. It uh, always takes a village, but uh, a village of such kind and smart people is uh, anomalous, I think we can all say. So it's been a complete delight to be able to engage this uh, panoply of figures who I have been long reading and am now in the uh, position to actually speak back to in a way that's deeply intimidating, but also the best tribute that I can think of. So I'm going to very briefly give you a couple orienting uh, tools because the talk is a bit dense and it's a bit dizzying because I'm basically going to take us through Foucault's last decade and the ways in which his own conceptions and conceptualizations of Christianity shifts. So if you go to the website for this talk, that's foucaultsconfessions.org backslash Nikki hyphen Clements, there are two visuals that provide a timetable that goes through the chronology. And this is an anchor, right? We're not finding answers, but I do want to give everyone, especially those who have not been as familiar with this last decade, those who are not familiar with Foucault very much at all, this is a way to get your bearings as I move between year to year. This is also an opportunity to uh, show the different research tools that have been developed through uh, my collaboration with the Center for Research Computing at Rice, uh, John Mulligan, who has been building these tools that I have been putting out on the internet in my uh, newfound uh, Twitter voice over the last couple months. It was to promote this series. I abhor social media, but it's also been an incredible delight to be in touch with people all over the world. And one of the tools that I've been offering is the database of Foucault's citations of Christian sources, not exclusively Christian sources, but these are the sources that he is citing, not only in his text, Les Evades de la Chair, Confessions of the Flesh, that we are contextualizing today, but also throughout his last decade. So there's a, a very comprehensive list that you can scroll through. And basically year by year, you can see exactly what Foucault is citing and oftentimes the passage that is in the text. There's also an editorial note that I would like to make, which is that sometimes the apparatus of the Collège de France lectures, the other collections that have been put out, insert texts in order to illuminate what Foucault is talking about, but they are not references that Foucault directly makes. And I think it's important to parse these two things. So being able to say, this is what Foucault is actually working with at that time, ends up having larger theoretical purchase than uh, one might expect. So that is the uh, kind of intro, but feel free to follow along and engage these tools as you move. And finally, the visualizations. These are the pretty charts that people like so much. Uh, this is also, all of these are linked through to that first page. But we have uh, this database that you just saw translated into these visualizations, where if you click on this little drop-down menu, it will take you to different thresholds. And by that, it means how many times Foucault has cited a particular text. If he has cited it once, you can see the entire map is very dense and unreadable. If you want anything that he cited more than nine times, then you see that the space opens up. So this is a very quick way of charting on the left side, Foucault's lectures, in the middle, the particularly late ancient Christian authors, and on the right, the text that he is citing therein. So I encourage you to play around with this. I think this is a very helpful tool for engaging not only Foucault in terms of his own research practice, but also for setting up 
some of the ways in which his own views are constantly changing, the complexity that he's finding in these texts, and also opening up these possibilities of learning how to challenge and critique some of his readings in order to better be able to take up some of the theoretical purchase that I find so necessary today. So toward the last hour of the last lecture of the last year of his life, on March 28, 1984, Michel Foucault takes his auditors at the Collège de France back to early Christianity. His 1983, 84 lectures had focused on Parisia in Greek and Roman antiquity. Foucault had moved from Parisia as a frank quality of speech in 1982 to a political practice challenging tyrants, as with Plato in 1983, to an ethical practice of embodying resistance to power, as with Diogenes in 1984. In his last years, Foucault devotes attention to ancient care for the self and practices of freedom. We see this partially reflected in Foucault's 1984 publications, The Use of Pleasure and the Care of the Self, the second and third volumes in the History of Sexuality series. Yet, as our first speaker, James Bernauer, has long argued, Foucault comes to the force of ethics through his reading of the Christian experience. And on this last day of his college lectures, Foucault stresses continuities over differences between cynic and stoic philosophy on the one hand and early Christian forms of life. He says, maybe I will try to explore these themes a little next year, but I cannot guarantee it. I confess that I still don't know and have not yet decided. That's uh, mais sous toute réserve, j'avoue que je n'en sais encore rien. Je suis pas encore décidé. Maybe I will try to pursue this history of the arts of living, of philosophy as form of life, of asceticism and its relation to the truth precisely after ancient philosophy in Christianity. In this final lecture, Foucault strikingly presents his analysis of Christianity as incomplete. And we should keep this in mind when approaching his posthumously published Les Aveux de Lecher, just translated in English as Confessions of the Flesh. Our series, the Foucault series of talks, involves scholars from many disciplines. Yet these various perspectives illuminate different ways in which we might understand the incompleteness of Foucault's confessions. My offering today operates in tandem with Philippe Chevalier's superb account of the genesis of Les Aveux, while engaging the genealogical possibilities that Lynn Huffer and Mark Jordan theorized for Foucault's counterconduct through a queer poetics, while keeping in mind the critical optimism James Bernauer framed in the person of Foucault as an activist scholar. Peter Brown makes an expected cameo, and I have Elizabeth Clark to thank for modeling rigorous history as the best avenue for critique. The other members of our series, Achille Membe, Daniele Lorenzini, Martina Tazioli, Ariana Sporzini, and of course, Jim Fabian, have all contributed to the ways in which I've been working through this material and are at the foundation of the ways in which I see interdisciplinarity as a necessary practice as opposed to something that might be an add-on. Today, I take the archival approach to Foucault's confession, his Jean Veux by framing how Foucault wrestles with constructions of Christianity from 1974 to 1984. I see this archival, textual, historical work as critical to my broader theological project to engage Foucault's late ethics because his own attention to ethics comes in tandem with his wrestling with how to understand Christianity in the history of his present. Two questions haunt Foucault for decades. These are, why are we obliged to tell the truth about ourselves? Which truth? These are found in box 40 in the archives of the Bibliothèque Nationale. And what begins as his suspicion towards confession as a tool of Catholic power becomes his critical genealogy of subjectivity from Western antiquity. Analyzing Foucault's decade-long engagement helps frame confessions to the flesh as neither Foucault's final word on Christianity nor even on ethics. <laughs>
Surprise or confusion over Foucault's engagement with Christianity is part of a broader question. Basically, what happens between Foucault's 1976 History of Sexuality, Volume 1, The Volonté de Savoir, uh, or an introduction in English, all about biopower, theorizing powers, relations, and his uh, next series of monographs in 1984, Volumes 2 and 3 in the History of Sexuality, which turn to sexual ethics in ancient Greece and Rome. Foucault is here reorganizing his entire series around the quote, slow formation in antiquity of a hermeneutics of the self, end quote. And he says this in volume two's introduction, yet this announcement does not capture the force of his series shift. Expanded access to Foucault's work enables a more thorough assessment of his last decade. And on the basis of both published and archival evidence, notably at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, where we're supposed to be last year and we'll hopefully be able to go back this summer. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a lot of work that I'm currently synthesizing, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of transcriptions and notes, as well as um, the archives at the UC Berkeley, Bancroft, and um, a little foyer into the uh, Bibliothèque Chassoua in the 13th, where Foucault would spend the last years of his life researching. Today, I'm going to sketch three stages in Foucault's year-to-year -year conceptualizations of Christianity, starting with stage one, roughly 1974 to 1978, from prison to the pastorate. Foucault's work on power turns his attention towards constructions of Christianity and confession. What begins as an interest in Catholic confessional manuals that bore Foucault to death and Philippe Chevalier's delightful evocation moves to an unpacking of the institutional and juridical conditions for modern disciplinary subjects. Foucault's most cited work, Discipline and Punish, telegraphs many of the critical moves he makes over the next decade. Here, Foucault famously describes the, quote, historical reality of the soul as the prison of the body, born out of methods of punishment, supervision, and constraint, end quote. He also ties Christianity centrally to confession as a public ritual, as we see in the opening of Discipline and Punish with the flesh torn yet verbally pious Gabion, and the cell as a, te a technique of Christian monachism. Foucault suggests the logic of disciplinary power has historical antecedents in the monastic communities that made discipline, self-regulation, and subjection a way of life through a focus on detail, individuation, and vitiation. Basically, if you are vitiated, you can't rebel because you're exhausted. Striking today, isn't it? Foucault contrasts medieval and early modern disciplines of a monastic type whose function was to obtain renunciations with their 17th and 18th century corollaries, where such disciplinary mechanisms came out from the monastery and, quote, became general formulas of domination, end quote. Foucault's November 1973 Collège de France lectures on psychiatric power already established the soul as, quote, projected behind disciplinary power, end quote, and identified the disciplinary apparatuses and monastic religious communities that in the late 17th and 18th centuries, quote, appear and are established, which no longer have a religious basis, end quote. The correlation between monastic discipline, domination, and renunciation becomes a central theme in Foucault's readings of Christianity. On August 26, 1974, Foucault completes Discipline and Punish after four years of work. That same day, according to his partner, Daniel Dupin, he starts writing the first volume in a projected six volume series on the history of sexuality. In volume one, Foucault discusses Christianity in relation to the imposition of confessional practices since the Lateran Council and the Council of Trent. He develops his focus on 16th and 17th century practices of confession, the pastorate, and the flesh from his 1974-1975 Collège de France lectures, Les Anormaux, or Abnormal. Foucault considers the sacrament of penance in volume one as a means of analyzing how, quote, the scope of the confession, the confession of the flesh continually increased, end quote. He connects Christian confession and the modern incitement to discourse, noting how, quote, the scheme for transforming sex into discourse had been devised long before in an ascetic and monastic setting. 
the 17th century made it a rule for everyone, end quote. Out from the monastery and into the everyday, the confessional impulse, notably of sexual desire, becomes a condition of modern Western subject formation. Volume one's 1976 publication announces five more volumes in the history of sexuality. Volume two, La Chair Le Corps, The Flesh and the Body, would develop how, quote, the reformed pastoral also laid down rules, albeit in a more discreet way, for putting sex into discourse, end quote expanding Foucault's argument that the history of sexuality has its beginnings in the technology of the flesh in classical Christianity. Although Foucault largely destroyed a draft of volume two, there are parts of a manuscript on confession and concupiscence in the 16th and 17th centuries, correlated particularly with box 89, La Chère Le Corps, although there are others we can point to later. In volume one, Foucault projects the last four volumes would move to quote, the four great strategies that were developed in the 19th century. Volume three on masturbating children, volume four on hysterical women, volume five on the medicalization of homosexuality and perverts, and volume six on the control of population and the biologization of race. So a lot saucier than it ends up. Foucault thus begins his analysis of the Christian pastoral and confession of the flesh in his abnormal lectures, volume one, an introduction, and originally conceived volume two as the flesh and the body. He connects the Christian pastoral, which discovers the flesh and places it into a juridical framework to the production of institutional forms whose rationalities he problematizes in his earlier works, psychiatry in the asylum and history of madness, medicine in the birth of the clinic and incarceration and in discipline and punish. In interviews from 1977, Foucault connects the Christian procedure of confession, la veu, to sexuality as at the heart of human existence and to its eventual expansion beyond rituals of penance. Foucault's analyses in these years rest largely on caricatures of pre-modern Christianity as tied to subjection and an inquisitorial logic. And we can find really interesting uh, reading notes within the archives that um, illuminate this as well. In August 1977, according to Dufour, Foucault starts to read and write on early Christians, moving back at least a millennia in the process. After a year of sabbatical from 76 to 77, Foucault's 78 lectures for the Collège de France Security, Territory, Population, or STP, begin to engage textual resources in antiquity in order to develop his conception of pastoral power more robustly. Omnes et singulatum, the whole and the individual, defines both, quote, the techniques of power in Christian pastorship and of the, let's say, modern techniques of power deployed in the technologies of population, end quote. Via the organizing logics of biopower with which he opens these 1978 lectures and which were to uh, be featured in volume six, of the original six volume History of Sexuality series, as well as in his 1976 lecture, Society Must Be Defended, Foucault connects the mechanisms of detail, individuation, and vitiation articulated in Discipline and Punish to those of subject formation. As he writes on the construction of the flesh and the confessional imperative, Foucault expands his second volume to other forms of truth telling. Foucault's research on early Christian writers hones in on, quote, the origin of the idea of a government, first in the idea and organization of a pastoral type of power, and second in the practice of spiritual direction, the direction of souls. He continues to broadly characterize Christianity sweepingly, absolutely unique in history. Whenever there are inflated adverbs, there is um, something to be suspicious of, I tell my graduate students. <laughs> Foucault is a master of nuance. Whenever he's saying absolutely or completely or everyone knows, it's usually about Christianity, you'll see. He also insists on the lasting influence of these mechanisms. In these 1978 college lectures, he also begins to articulate counterconduct as contesting dominant forms of power, noting Martin Luther and even Christian ascetics as examples of resistance to pastoral power. You may recall that in Volume one, Foucault paints a contrast between the Ars Erotica on the one hand, 
which is roughly the erotic arts that Foucault identifies with Asian religious traditions as well as ancient Rome, and the scientia sexualis, the science of sexuality. And this is what he ties to Christianity in particular. In Tokyo in 1978, Foucault specifies how, quote, the West introduces to sexuality, it develops starting with sexuality, an entire complex mechanism in which it is a question of the constitution of individuality, of subjectivity, in brief, of the manner in which we behave and in which we become conscious of ourselves, end quote. He then frames the science of sexuality as tied to, quote, the flesh, the subjectivity itself of the body, end quote, and rooted in third to fourth century practices as Christianity becomes a social and political force in the Roman Empire. This leads me to the second stage in my schematization to analyze the emergence of the scientia sexualis and its rendering of sex into discourse, Foucault moves away from his originally conceived six volume series. He abandons volumes two's attention to reformation and counter-reformation practices of confession as he seeks the roots of such practices in the second through fifth century texts that he anticipates will expose the emergence of the mechanisms that link sexuality and subjectivity. In this first stage from 1974 to 1978, Foucault moves from early modern Christian disciplinary apparatuses to ancient Christian pastoral power in the genealogy of the desiring subject he will develop over this decade. Stage two, 1979 to 1982. If the dates are a bit too dense, just screen them out. Let the narrative wash over you instead. Stage two, 1972 to 82, charts the period when Foucault engages early Christian texts most centrally and drafts Les de la Chair. We can see particularly part one, uh, chapter four of Les Aveux, Le, L'Arc des Arts, The Art of Arts, as particularly located within the intersection between the STP lectures, the Tanner lectures at Stanford that I'm about to talk about a bit, and uh, the Government of the Living in 1980. As Foucault shifts away from the six volume history of sexuality and its modern foci, the second volume becomes the textual fulcrum for the four volume series eventually published. Foucault abandons La Chère et la Cour as the second volume and according to Defer starts to write Les Aveux de la Chère, Confessions of the Flesh, on ancient Christianity in January, 1979. Later in 1979, Foucault changes his longstanding research locale from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France to the Bibliothèque de Chassois in the small Dominican library in the 13th arrondissement. That October, 1979, Foucault presents Omnis et Simulatum towards a criticism of political reason at Stanford University. Here, Foucault begins to theorize liberation as possible only by attacking, quote, political rationality's very roots, end quote, in both Christian pastoral power and the raison d'etat, reason of state. Unmasking the mechanisms of pastoral power and state power becomes the condition for their subversion. Foucault thus suggests how to theorize robust resistance and counter conduct. In his 1979 1980 college lectures on the government of the living, Foucault completes an analytical move from power to governmentality and from knowledge to truth with an early Christian set of characters. Second to third century Christians like Tertullian reorganized the relationship between subjectivity and truth through eximologesis as a ritual disclosure of one's converted identity performed in practices of baptism and ecclesial penance. Foucault stresses exagerousis as a corollary practice connecting truth acts and remission of sins in fourth to fifth century monasticism through obedience, incessant examination of conscience, and exhaustive confession. Notably, in the works of John Cashin, Foucault sees the subject as turning inwards, as, quote, Christianity autonomized knowledge of self as an endless task, end quote. Between February 20th and March 26th, 
Foucault shifts his reading of the quote, truth of the soul as no longer essential to baptism and penitence, but vital to self-examination and confession as Philippe Chevalier has long argued. Two shifts in his 1980 college course come to define Foucault's final work. One, a thematic reframing of subjectivity and truth, and two, an analytic contrast between ancient Greek self-relations as active and tied to the pursuit of truth, and monastic Christian self-relations as bound by obedience and renunciation. With people clamoring to hear his October 1980 house and lectures at the University of California, Berkeley, Foucault synthesizes his research over the year by analyzing exenlogesis and exegeresis in relation to, quote, the genealogy of the modern self. Unquote. Recapitulated in November 1980 at Dartmouth College, these lectures read early monastic Christian technologies of the self as relying on a hermeneutics of the self, which involves a constant suspicion towards oneself and unconditional submission to one's superiors. Foucault's focus shifts from Cassian and confession to Augustine and sexuality for his November 1980 James Lecture and seminars at the Institute for Humanities at New York University. This shift takes place after Foucault and Peter Brown discuss Cassian, though barely Augustine, in Berkeley that October. In November 20th, 1980, the seminar manuscript has Foucault noting, a few weeks ago, Dr. Peter Brown told me, quote, quote, what we have to understand is why sexuality became in the Western Christian culture the seismograph of our subjectivity, end quote, quote. In what would be published as Sexuality and Solitude in 1981, Foucault contrasts the Greco-Roman problem of penetration with the problem of erection in Augustine's conception of libido. Notably considering, quote, the relation one has to oneself through sex or through sex experience, or more precisely through an experience Latin authors called concubiscentia. There are a couple of really fascinating archival points I want to make very briefly here because this gets to the heart of ongoing work and also responds a bit to uh, some of the work already presented today. As uh, Philippe Chevalier was describing last week, the uh, preface to History of Sexuality, Volume 2, in the uh, Foucault Reader, is actually misdated, and it's um, actually in the 1981 folder in the Bancroft Archive at Berkeley. And the published version of this in the Foucault Reader is excerpted from a longer preface that is in the, the Bancroft archives. And the reason why I bring this up is because in this draft written in 1981, Foucault is explicitly citing and engaging Peter Brown's Making of Late Antiquity. And there are also resonances with some of the lectures that Peter Brown gave in 1980, the Hale lectures. And this is really important because it shows that Foucault is explicitly engaging in the reframing of his History of Sexuality series with explicit quotes and engagement with Brown, which is to say with an explicit sense of the need for historical analysis of social practices and the ways in which this was shaping his own genealogy of subjectivity. So here, as in many of the points I'm making today, having a historical critical sense is requisite for being able to understand the larger theoretical questions. And here, Brown's influence is clear, at least to my mind. There are also a number of overlapping points in the archive from this box in the Bibliothèque Nationale, box 40, which correspond to parts two and three in uh, Confessions of the Flesh. And these correspond to box 40, folder six, basically, three through six within that. And I just say this up as a little inside baseball for those who are in the know, because I would love to know what uh, Ariana Sposini and, uh, and Daniele and Philippe also think about this marking. The upshot is that there is a large portion of Les Aveux that is being written in this late 1980, 1981 time period when Foucault is not only thinking about how to understand Christianity as a confession in relation to Cassian, 
but is also starting to see some really fascinating possibilities open up, especially within Augustine and constructions of sexuality as tied to the genealogy of modern subjectivity. In short, history matters, Foucault saw it, and this is really changing the way in which he's conceiving of his history of sexuality series. Foucault's early 1981 college lectures, Subjectivity and Truth, primarily attend to texts from Roman antiquity, folding Christian comparisons therein. Foucault intensifies his use of Greek and Roman philosophical and medical texts, and in, and in June 1981, indicates his intent to publish a work under a title that comes to be known as Souci de Soi, or Care of the Self. This third volume in the history of sexuality germinates in his 1981 college lectures as Foucault asks, quote, what took place in the first century CE at the turning point of what is called pagan ethics and Christian morality, end quote. Pursuing an answer through pagan sexual ethics, Foucault parses how the arts of living on the art of conducting oneself emerged with such prominence in antiquity, quote, lasted for a very long time and has now disappeared. Foucault does not oppose pagan ethics to Christian morality and develops his readings of early Christian texts with attention to the eroticization of marriage, codification of sexual relations between man and wife, and quote, the big question in Christian thought, St. Augustine's question, but also our question, what in truth is our desire? Augustine comes to play a key role in how Foucault sees the shifting relationship between subjectivity and sexuality, both in these 1981 lectures and in Eve, notably in the imperative of procreation and the marital obligation of sexual intercourse. While such practices are common to Hellenistic sexual ethics, Foucault sees the relationship to truth as that which has changed, differentiating, quote, the Christian experience of the flesh from the Greek experience of the aphrodisia. In his 1982 college lectures, Hermeneutics of the Subject, Foucault continues to engage early Christian texts as a foil for defining Greek and Roman ethical texts. The lectures foreground ancient Greek and Hellenistic subject matter focusing on the care of the self, epimeleia reaptu, or in the Latin cura sui, as anchoring the Delphic diction or injunction to know oneself, the noti satan. Foucault shifts the form of self-relation from arts of living in 1981 to the care of the self in 1982, as he asks, quote, why did Western thought and philosophy neglect the notion of epimeleia heptu in its reconstruction of its own history? Considering modern philosophy as splitting the care of the self from the knowledge of the subject, since at least Descartes, Foucault extols ancient philosophical attention to their integration. In a striking continuity between ancient Greek and early Christian texts, Foucault describes Socrates and the fourth century Christian Gregory of Nyssa as bookends in an eighth century span for whom attending to the self, quote, is a form of life. Foucault sees merely formal differences in the care of the self until Christian monastic practices and the examination of conscience are institutionalized in particularly the fourth and fifth centuries. Foucault highlights Cashin in particular as inaugurating the quote, decipherment of interiority, the subject's exegesis of himself, end quote. For Foucault, early Christian confession as exegerusis involves novice monastics submitting to elders, confessing every shameful movement of their thought and renouncing those thoughts as part of their selves. The mechanisms of confession shape subjectivity as the incitement to tell the interior truth about oneself correlates with the injunction to disavow that very self. In these 1982 lectures, Foucault engages the ethics of the subject defined by the relationship of self to self. He also publicly introduces the concept of parousia as free speech. You can see this in his University of Grenoble lecture on parousia, as well as lectures he delivers at the University of Toronto. Meanwhile, Foucault continues to draft Les Verts de la Chère, which he submits to Gaimard in October 1982. That year, he publishes the only excerpt from Aveu, The Battle for Chastity on Cashin and the Spirit of Fornication. Incidentally, Peter Brown is also the only scholar mentioned in that piece, uh, even though that reference is um, excised from the published version and draft of Les Verts de la Chère. <clears throat> 
Between 1979 and 1982, Foucault carefully attends to early Christian texts and contexts, conceptualizing the arts of living, care of the self, and monastic production of disciplinary mechanisms that shape subjectivity. Now, third and more briefly and schematically, it's Foucault the Confessor, 1983 to 1984, which features ancient Greek and Roman materials and the ethical relationship between government of self and government of others, linking parousia as practices of truth-telling that differ from and create the conditions for contesting disciplinary confession. Foucault's 1983 college lectures, The Government of Self and Others, turned to parousia as a philosophical practice for governing others. In 1983, Foucault's college lectures frame parousia as a practice of governing others as a form of life, a site of truth telling that endures through the great Christian spirituality of the fourth and fifth centuries. So he's already talking about how this spirit endures in late ancient Christianity. In his fall 1983 lectures at the University of California, Berkeley, Foucault situates parousia at the intersection of the genealogy of modern subjectivity and the critical attitude in the problematization of truth. He then frames the institutionalization of the Christian pastoral in monasticism as changing this courageous relation. Instead of a critical practice, monastic truth telling subordinates novice to elder and produces the mechanisms reinforcing institutional power and dogmatic truth claims. Foucault's treatment of Christianity is textually minimal yet vital to how he conceptualizes human experience. While ancient self-relation allows subjects to be both shaped and self-shaping in order to govern others in this ethical relation, monastic subjects are constituted through subjection and obedience. Opening his 1984 lectures of the College Courage of Truth as it's published in the um, editions, Foucault specifies that examining parousia enables analysis of all three domains constitutive of experience. Those are the modes of veridiction, correlated with knowledge, techniques of governmentality, correlated with power, and forms of practices of the self that we can correlate with ethics. While already shaped as subjects, the Parisiest both contributes to their own shaping through practices of the self and critiques political and social formations. Foucault's 1984 analysis of Parisia seems to even cut at the twin roots he described in 1979 at those Stanford lectures, exposing the mechanisms of individualization and totalization in the Christian pastorate and modern biopower. Foucault closes his 1984 lectures by extending the radical potential of cynic parousia exemplified by Diogenes, who engages, quote, the idea of a mode of life as the eruptive, violent, scandalous manifestation of the truth, end quote, to ancient Christianity itself. In contrast to positive parousia's, quote, unrestrained and free aspect, end quote, in the truth telling of martyrs and ascetics, the sobbing matrons, queer virgins, Pastoral power becomes the negative form of truth imposition as the success of its institutionalization annuls critical liberatory potential. That day that we started with May 20 or March 28th, 1984, Foucault delivers his last lecture at the Collège de France, apologizing for not having the energy to go on. He forces his analysis to close with the transition from ancient, critical, positive parousia to the Christian pastoral's form of subjugating negative parousia that voids critical potential power by institutionalizing dogmatics as truth. Nevertheless, Foucault also recognizes that positive forms of parousia endure in medieval mystics challenges to church authority. And between March and May of 1984, Foucault continues to edit Elizabeth Lecha. As we opened the hour today, notably thinking about the ways in which he could continue to expand on how the arts of living, philosophy as a form of life could be engaged more robustly within early Christianity. So before I end, I want to just sketch very uh, briefly three different pieces that are in the archives and ready to hand because it gives a sense of the materials Foucault had as he was working on the edits for Les Aveux between uh, March and May of 1984. And I'll say them very briefly so that we can just open these up as questions for the future. But I think this gives a sense 
that is really necessary of how incomplete and ongoing this process is. Foucault is not merely revising a text and editing or subtracting, he is also taking in his broader views, his decade of grappling with these questions of Christianity, needing to both close the gap in his genealogy of modern subjectivity and also do justice to what he's finding as a researcher, as a scholar, as a student of Western thought and practice. So the first one is in box 84, folder 11, sur la table. This is where we found the, uh, uh, the piece by Peter Brown on Augustine sexuality. There's also a piece, a page from Les Aveux, page 122, that is on monastic obedience. And three, there are 10 handwritten pages on lactus veritatis, exomologesis, and penitence. These overlap with Annex 2 as published and also relate back to the Tanner Lectures and STP that uh, I described with Mark Jordan last week. This suggests that Foucault himself does not evolve in his reading of Christianity, but instead there are recursions. He's constantly grappling with the ways in which these shifts continue to inform his views instead of seeing them as outdated. Number two is uh, sur le divan, or the, uh, the couch in box 55, folder two, which is seen to be in preparation for the government of the living. And it has three sections, one on um, the penitential status, two on acts of truth, and three, an untitled one. But basically these also connect to annex two. And the third one, sur le bureau, box 89, folder six, la chair le corps, has two pages that are isolated on the desk that is between the exercises for a vœu and a photocopy on parousia. And these sheets are very brief, but they roughly correlate with uh, Foucault's notes from the 1980 or 1981 edits that he was making on Chrysostom. So this gives it just a very quick uh, schematic view of uh, the materials that Foucault has ready to hand as he's editing, and they're all from different stages of his engagement with Christianity, which shows a number of things, but I will suggest one. These, these archival fragments are important not only because they indicate what Foucault returns to as he edits Les Aveux. They also show how he reaches across different moments of his own readings of Christianity. There is no easy developmental view of his grappling with Christianity Instead, the messiness and complexity help us resist the need for answers. To conclude, as Foucault pursues his History of Sexuality series, he moves from other schematic readings of Christianity from 74 to 78, to careful analyses of ancient Christian texts from 79 to 82, concurrently expanding their genealogical stakes for understanding modern subjectivity. During the time that he is working on the Zavu starting January 79, through the influence of Paul Ving, Foucault comes to understand his original introduction to the Zavu as rife with cliches of pagan ethics, so engages source material on ancient Greek and Roman sexual ethics in greater detail between 1980 and 1984. Yet as his final confession in March 1984, his ongoing edits of the Zavu between March and May and the materials he calls for this purpose confirm that Foucault's engagement with Christianity does not end in 1980, nor in 1982, nor even in 1984. Even a quick consideration of the materials he has on hand as he edits Les Avos shows how any attempt to pin down an answer will just lead to more questions. I therefore read Foucault not as poet, as philosopher, as historian, as activist, or as monk, although he might be all of those things, but I read him as a researcher. Following his own archival practices, his drafts, his crossed out arguments, tables of contents, and reframings of points using French, English, ancient Greek, Latin, German, and Spanish, through these archival folds, I learned not what Foucault thought, but who he was thinking with, and how open he was to changing his own mind, practicing the critical sensibility he theorizes. Thank you ever so much ever so much, Nikki. Um, if anyone thought she was going to disappointment, disappoint us, um, that person was wrong. Um, uh, because I am, uh, in, actually, Nikki, you're 
officially the host of this Zoom session. Fortunately, that relieves me from having to figure out how to proceed. Um, so <laughs> I will turn over the uh, fielding of questions to you and save myself the embarrassment of showing my incompetence. But uh, once again, thank you. Well, uh, I encourage people to uh, write questions, put them in a QA. and I don't think that you can actually use the chat, but the, uh, uh, the, the talk is based on a piece that was recently published in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion. And there you can actually see the larger theoretical stakes that bring me to the historical work. Oh, great, chat works. So everyone can feel free to chat with each other. If you want to ask me direct questions, you can use the Q&A. Um, questions of clarification, complaints, critiques, everything is invited. But the, the reason why I take up Foucault as a, a researcher is because the more that I was in the archives, the more I was able to figure out where some of his readings were coming from and how his readings changed over time. And I came to this because uh, I was really uh, 20 years ago reading Cashin and finding Cashin wherever I could. And I ended up finding Cashin not in uh, the shelves in the library that were mostly on Augustine, but instead in Foucault. And so my, my own background is one where engaging historically and theoretically with Cashin came hand in hand with a historical and theoretical engagement with Foucault. And in both cases, my aim, my orientation is towards using rigorous critique in order to be able to constructively think through questions of ethics today. And I think that these two figures, John Cashin and Michel Foucault, in very different ways, end up being really compelling sites for thinking through questions of ethical formation and how can we both be shaped by so many conditions, yet also self-shaping in some way that isn't solipsistic and only about the self, but is a challenge to the norms at play that enacts a challenge to uh, the uh, forms of uh, subjection simply by committing to an art of living that is a bit different. Decentering those norms and humanizing practices. So I will take a few questions at this stage and note with, uh, oh, well, very kind note from Deborah, thank you. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much. When you say that history matters, what do you mean by history? Foucault famously denounced history, Alessart, or even Hegel. Please discuss relation with relation to genealogy and also how this relates to his identity as a researcher. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I think that the short way to put it is that Foucault is certainly um, against any kind of teleological history, any kind of master narrative. In fact, he's setting up genealogy in order to break down such master narratives. And uh, the way in which I'm thinking about history as a practice, right, it's a, it's a way of thinking about how in order to evaluate, let's say Foucault on Cashin or tomorrow with Liz Clark on Augustine, we need a sense of uh, how do we not just take his reading for granted? How do we also pull from the historical texts and forms of uh, inquiry that other scholars have been engaging for so long? And so when I say that history matters for Foucault, it's history of our present, right? It's not history for history's sake, but it's history insofar as it sets up the Kantian conditions of possibility for who and what we are today. But by going back into this genealogy, you can start to unpack the mechanisms, right? You can start to see and expose the way in which power has covered over the ways in which it shapes us. And by opening up these views, one sees not only the contingency of certain narratives today, certain narratives of dehumanization and pathologization, but one also can think through different ways of being, think through different ways of considering arts of living. And I think that's what Foucault is getting through this genealogy, where having that sense of what has created the conditions for today requires historical analysis. And it requires good historical analysis, not to say that there's any kind of positivism at all. There's no kind of uh, nostalgia either, but there is certainly a sense that we can do and think differently, right? Pensez autrement. And one way to do that is to engage critically, both historically and philosophically. 
And I think that's, that is what it means uh, to, to be a researcher, I think in this Foucauldian sense. At least I take up so much of uh, Foucault's own ethos from being in the archive and really tremendously having the opportunity, thanks to uh, Philippe Chevalier, Liz Clark, Laurence Lefa, having the ability to actually work through Foucault's own reading notes to see how his own transformations of thought move from rather generic views in the uh, dictionaries, TDNT, Dictionnaire de Spiritualité, Beauchamp, uh, the Royal Lexicon in German, and how he ends up taking up secondary sources. And as he does that, his readings expand, whether it's Peter Brown or Meslin or uh, Lea. And finally, how he engages the texts themselves with a kind of historical force that might not be correct, <laughs> but that isn't what matters, right? So I will take the next question. David Collins, how much attention did Foucault give to the limits of his focus to Western Christian materials for his analyses? I know he at least gave a bit of personal practical attention to Buddhist meditation. Yeah, I think this comes back to the genealogy point, which is that Foucault is engaging in the history of his present, which is to say, this is a deeply Western genealogy. And this is not to glorify the Western forms of, uh, of thought that develop, but instead to be aware of their dangers. There is a, a kind of, um, veneer that Foucault seems to have over some of the other Buddhist materials, his contrast between the Ars Erotica and the Scientia Sexualis, for example, is, uh, is striking because he sees the, the Ars Erotica as something that is um, more in line with the arts of living that he ends up extolling. <laughs> Foucault famously talks about um, this isn't Buddhist, but Japanese. So in his uh, Berkeley lectures, he refers to Tanizaki's The Key. And this is for him an example of how discourse around sexuality is very different in Asian contexts, which over schematizes things, but it's kind of fascinating the way that Foucault reads these things. So he's pretty unapologetic about the, uh, the Western focus, but I don't think that he would have limited himself if I can be so bold as to speculate. I think that instead, this is a question of genealogy for him, which means that he is not trying to give a history of everything, right? That's exactly the kind of capture that I think Len Hopper was, uh, was asking about. There is no one narrative, but the narrative that Foucault is giving is a narrative that allows us to see where we are today in terms of contingency instead of necessity. And if we can do that, then we can start to open up new ways of doing things. Yeah, okay. Um, James Cronin, I'm glad you're enjoying it. On the theme of disrupting the master narrative, can you say more about your sense of Foucault's uh, Catholicity through your understanding of the archive? Yeah, this is a really interesting question and I'm gonna resist responding to this question on Foucault's own biographical grounds because that's not my project. But I will say that in terms of how Foucault is thinking about Catholicism is uh, one of the uh, central issues and one of the great litmuses in how his own transformation of um, understanding of Christianities really takes place. So for example, in 1973, in the earlier years, he's dealing not only with the forms of Catholic confession in the 17th to 18th centuries, and then moves back a bit to the 16th to 17th with the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. But he's still foregrounding confession and the incitement to discourse in relation to the uh, Catholic authority that is so dominant and has been so destructive, I think, for, um, for normalizing certain ways of being human. So we were discussing, you know, LGBTQ or queer rights the other day and the way that Foucault is very suspicious of this incitement to tell the truth about oneself 
I said I wasn't going to do this, but I did it anyway. Uh, but I think that that sense of that compulsion is uh, for him a big part of not only the problem with modern psychiatry and medicine and, um, and the clinic, but also Catholic confession in particular. And I think that he goes back into history in order to figure out how these mechanisms were created. He returns not only then to the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, but then goes all the way back to Cassian and the early Christians because he's trying to think through, well, how did the mechanisms themselves get shaped? And it's in Cassian that the uh, subjects exegesis of themselves this movement towards interiority. I think this is really where there's a sense of uh, a different subjectivity that is being shaped. And it's one that is deeply Catholic insofar as it then gets taken up and institutionalized in a particular way. But I think Foucault kind of lets some of his ca Catholic hangups go at a certain stage as he's reading these early Christian materials and realizes that he can actually do interesting things thinking through not only questions of power and domination, but the need for a resistance to that power and domination that comes in part through the arts of living and ethics as a relationship of self to self in antiquity. So there's a lot more to say there. There are so many fascinating boxes that engage Foucault's readings of Catholicism. And um, I just apologize, we don't have enough time. Okay. So many pieces. Uh, so Tekia, uh, Tekla, Tekla Babia. Many thanks, thank you back. It's fascinating to think about how Foucault became interested in early Christianity. Do you think that perhaps Foucault's critique of psychoanalysis played a role in this? I wonder if his critical engagement with the talking cure might've gotten him thinking about Christian confessional practices. Yes. Agreed, totally. This professor is able to stick with a one word answer, <laughs> by the way. And uh, Randall Johnson, being a researcher as an openness to critical sensibility seems to imply a relation to truth. However, it is conceptualized as at some liminality between historical time as somehow accessible in the archive towards a history of the present, which is in some, uh, which is in some, in some ways difficult to articulate relation with futural time as somewhat outside of time, yet we can perhaps glimpse. I'm curious how you would see Foucault as researcher in relation to futural truth. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the epistemic issues here are really important. The, the kind of focus that Foucault has in the last uh, couple months of his Collège de France lectures, where he's talking about the cynic engagement with these uh, eruptive forms of life. And they're oriented towards, as he says, l'autre vie, right, the other life. And it's unclear if this is a kind of eschatological futurality or if it is one of simple possibility, a uh, simple possibility of the ways in which we might reshape and rethink the way that we are shaped and can shape society today. So I want to avoid the kind of eschatological or um, crypto-Christian reading and instead lean into the ways in which Foucault's receptivity to and desire for thinking differently does not want to impose a narrative where something is true and that we are only glimpsing in certain ways. But instead, I think that he's saying that we need to open ourselves and our own capacity for thinking through what is possible in our own presence. So whatever is anti-dogmatic is the, the way to go. And uh, is the, uh, from Richard Stryer, is the idea that Augustine made sexuality central to the practice and theory of confession? Well, the, Okay, I see that some people have uh, ooh, their hands up. So I will go to them as well. Um, I'll say that the, the idea is not that Augustine made sexuality central to the practice of confession. There's a line that uh, Michel Sinalar has that I think is really um, spot on here. And it is a question of uh, bringing passions, mechanisms of confession in relation to Augustine's theory of sexuality and the juridification of sex 
which is how the, the, the two narratives end up coming together in a way that um, ends up having the more uh, dominating and hierarchical relations that Foucault will come to be very suspicious of and critique. So Augustine is not to blame, Cashin is to blame, but I think that's wrong, but there are so many other reasons for why I think that is the case. Ah, uh, yes, I lost you. So uh, Yosef Verheiden, it's so good to, uh, to see your name here. And I was hoping to incorporate you in here because I know that you also attended Foucault's Leuven lectures and wrote two masters, one on Foucault and the other on Cashin. So uh, Yosef uh, at Leuven, KU Leuven is a, a really exemplary interlocutor here. Hi, Justin Turin. Hi, yes. Well, thank you very much for paper. I've liked yours and I've liked most of the others that we have heard in the past days. I was wondering, uh, can I broaden the perspective a bit uh, in the sense that uh, as far as I've heard till now, no one has brought up the issue, why does Foucault end up, well, he didn't know that was ending up with that, but uh, why did he move towards the topic of sexuality and in this massive, on this massive scale, um, taking into account what he has been doing before. Do you see any logical, natural or whatever development in his work? Or is this like, uh, yeah, moving to another planet and starting completely new things? I don't think that is true. I think it's the first, but I would like to hear your opinion on it. Wonderful. Thank you. It's a, it's a really fantastic question. And certainly, I think a weaker spot because it's in that transition between the 60s and 70s, that I think the, the question that you're asking is um, answerable to some extent. And I think that his turn to sexuality is about the early 70s turn to thinking about um, carceral practices, He's doing his research on discipline and punish. He's thinking about alternatives to sovereign power through disciplinary power and thinking about the kind of mechanisms that are uh, therein, individuation, vitiation, et cetera. And I think it's within that fold that he comes to be interested in the confessional manuals. And of course the confessional manuals are you know, full of sex, but talk about sex. And this is, uh, um, this is inadequate, as I think Philippe Chevalier was describing uh, last week, maybe it was Mark Jordan, but the reason why Foucault then moves back from the, um, the confessional manuals is in part because he realized that was not actually giving real practices. And so moving away from uh, talking about sex to actual sexual ethics involves a, a much more interesting and nuanced shift in archives, as well as in uh, the domain of um, this incitement to discourse that Foucault had unpacked in uh, The Birth of the Clinic, History of Madness, even Discipline and Punish, but, um, but now is thinking about in, in relation to not only modern institutions, but the conditions for the very logic that undergirds them. So sexuality is at the very root of the rationalities that are structuring modern institutions I think takes him back to figure out this history of sexuality. And also because there's an interest right there. Uh, you know, how do we actually break norms? How do we find new ways of being? How do we uh, you know, take down governments that want to you know, ban, anti uh, ban trans legislation? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very long history where sexuality is both at the heart of things when it comes to how we become certain kinds of confessing subjects for Foucault, but is also, uh, setting up a logic. So it's more about the mechanisms that are put in place and uh, sexuality in itself is kind of uh, secondary. As Foucault says, sex is boring. I don't <laughs> I think he means it's boring to talk about. Why talk about it, right? Thank you so much, yes. Uh, Sterna? Hi. Shana, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Shana Friedman. Your hand is raised. 
Okay. <laughs> um, I will return to a couple of the earlier questions. I'll pick one from my colleague, Claire Fanger. I'd like to ask how thinking with Foucault has affected your own historical thinking about Cashin and his form of monasticism and whether you can offer other examples of people thinking with or against Foucault in a historical way that seem to you especially fertile. What is it that makes a fertile engagement with history? Yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, it's such an important question. And we've talked about this a bit. You have your uh, issue on the technologies and self coming out, which I think frames this question in a particular way. But I'll say that for me, it was important to me in my own training that I did not get trained as a theorist of Foucault first, nor as a historian of Cashin first, but instead at the same time, which is a strange effect of uh, coming of age in this millennium. And I think it's because I was reading these figures at the same time and so fascinated by the ways in which they think through ethics in very different domains and discourses, and yet both attend to human vulnerability and frailty and are rather frank about the ways in which life is struggle. And the, the, the reason why Cashin is of interest to Foucault in part is uh, because Cashin writes these books on nocturnal emissions and fornication and chastity. And those books are not translated into English until this millennium. Uh, they were translated in 1978 by uh, Terence Cardong, but they were not part of the broader corpus because of uh, you know, English pruderies. And so when thinking about Cashin, not like with Foucault, there's this question of how do we recognize what it is to be human in a way that doesn't pathologize, doesn't pathologize thoughts, desires, sexuality, identities, but instead allows us to think differently about how we can live today. So the, the, the way that Foucault affected my own historical thinking about Cashin was to hold at the center of, uh, of my thoughts, the theoretical aim and aspiration of not only this project, but also my larger work, which is to think through ethical agency. How can we shape ourselves and our lives in a world of constraints and vulnerabilities? And how can our own shaping of our own lives contribute to the critique of those forms of power? So for me, they're deeply interwoven. Any kind of historical question for me is always framed by a theoretical. It's not just me, but I think that the way in which we can then not say that Foucault just got some things wrong about this guy in history, but Foucault got these things wrong because of very particular reasons. I think that's fascinating. And tomorrow, Liz Clark will be talking about uh, Foucault's uh, reading of Augustine and critiquing it in a way that I hope that we can all uh, laud because I think this is precisely what we need to see happen if we're going to be engaging in the history of our present, not blindly accepting Foucault's own historical narrative and instead subjecting his own narrative to a critical eye that allows us to better understand what possibilities might be, by, um, might be in there as well. So this is, uh, Uh, ah, yes. Okay. And I will, I will end, if that's okay, with a, uh, a question from my, uh, my dear friend, David Lay, David Lowe, who is, uh, who is writing from New York. He says, can you say more about the broader theoretical stakes you mentioned discussing in the JAR article? Even your reference to anti-trans legislation was illuminating why this Foucault now, which is a, an excellent question that I think ties together a lot of the threads that, um, that I've been pulling on during the Q&A. And you know, the, the, the way that this Foucault has been presented, right, Elizabeth Lachère, I mean, the, the, the way that from 2018 and the release of this volume, and 2021, the release of this volume, means that people are coming back to a sense of uh, Foucault, but wanting to fix an answer once again, 
And I think that Mark Jordan, Lynn Hopper are both really cautioning against the need for an answer. There is no completeness here. Instead, there are just ways to take this into account when reading Foucault. Foucault is still the number one cited uh, scholar in the world across all disciplines, except for high energy particle physics. So the, <laughs> this is real. So the, the impact that Foucault has had, particularly through Discipline and Punish and his articulations of power is, uh, is outsized and deeply important and meaningful that I think that it misses uh, so much of what Foucault's own thought is calling for in his last decade, because uh, as Jim Bernauer said the very first day, there isn't adequate attention to the way in which Christianity is, is on his mind, right? This, uh, this false sense of the uh, sacred and secular separations, right? They said they, right? Oh, we don't need to talk about religion or Christianity. That's, um, you know, that's, that's bedroom talk. The, uh, the way then that this Foucault now is necessary, I think is needed in order to be able to not only think through Foucault's own changes in his thought over his last decade, grappling with these different histories, but he does it in order to be able to figure out some basic questions about how human experience is constituted, how we are both constituted through forms of power, forms of knowledge, and also have the capacity to shape ourselves. And we only really get that if we take seriously Foucault's own engagement with Christianity, because his engagement with Christianity that starts with obsessions with power and knowledge ends up taking him to the import of ethics, not only as a way of life and art of living, but also as a form of social power, a form of resistance, an embodied form of counterconduct. And I think that's why we need this Foucault now, because in terms of his uh, critical sensibility as a genealogist, in terms of his own wrestling with these modern institutions, tracing back the conditions of their possibility. Foucault gives us ways to think through not only the history of our present, vis-a-vis -vis the history of his present, but also how to think about a futurity that isn't either eschatological or utopian in any way. And instead we can think through the relationship between the formation of ourselves and the critique of social forms. And that is the kind of fight that I think as Jim Bernauer was describing two weeks ago, is in line with the critical optimism of Foucault as an activist scholar and certainly the kind of ethos that I hope to take up and learn from Foucault. And I invite you all to join me in doing. Nikki, that sounds like an absolutely beautiful punchline to an absolutely beautiful talk and engagement with uh, as many questioners as you could engage. Um, I will uh, mention uh, that tomorrow we will be hearing from Elizabeth Clark on uh, Foucault's Augustine, uh, to which Nikki has herself provided in many respects an uh, entree. I, I, I hope uh, you will be able to join us uh, and uh, look forward to what I'm sure will be a hard act to follow. <laughs> but if anyone uh, can do it, I think it's probably Elizabeth Clark. Um, so uh, thank you once again, Nikki, and thank you uh, all attendees. And we look forward to seeing you uh, all very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming and for sticking it out too. I'll take any questions through email. Thank you.